First off, I want to say to everyone last night, thank you, everybody who came and who spread the word. Last night was fun in a way I can't describe. Uh, I was telling people that was the most fun I had without drugs or alcohol uh, in probably 10 years. My suit when I got home was soaked, not from the rain or from sweat. I never had anything like that in a long time. That was a lot of fun. And it was in scoot of all of you and everything that we've done together since um, since Lag Omer, since the 49 days of the Omer. And, um, you know, we're, um, we're really doing something amazing, something really, really amazing. And it's organic. You know, a lot of people, they come with good ideas and, they, and they're like, oh, I have the next good idea. Let me make this thing happen. And what ends up happening, you see that even if they're able to create it, the reach of it is not very far. But sometimes when you don't come up with a new idea, you have an old idea and you live with it. You don't create a new idea, you literally live the idea. And people see that it's good and it's real. And then another guy comes along and he does the same and another guy and another girl and another girl and another guy. And then what ends up happening is it's so organic that it spreads like wildfire. You don't need to create a brand new Chiddush that's going to change the whole world. You need to live with a very old one. And um, you see that there's literally in Chicago, in Detroit, there's what the Shem Soon in Miami, uh, in New York, in New Jersey, little tiny pockets of communities of pe people who uh, feel connected to Tzion, who are living with the teachings and giving it out to other people. Even this past Shabbat, I saw multiple people on Shabbat, it was by Main Street, like, oh, Rav Kalmus, like, uh, you know, Kol Kavo, keep going. We're like really getting a lot of chizik from you. I didn't know who he was. I thought maybe it was one of those people who was from um, before my ECT treatment and I forgot him. And he told me, um, I said, how do you, you know, how do you connect? What do you know? He goes, you know, uh, Ariel, or Arie, sorry, Ariel Polstein from Chicago. And I go, yeah, I saw him. He was one of the four guys in my Chicago class. He told me about you. And then he pointed to another guy in a house over there. It like, and, and everyone's getting connected in the most roundabout way. And I feel like this is the whole Chiddush of Tzion, which is not really a Chiddush, which is that Hashem controls the world. And I think we just believe that. And we don't just believe it in our heads, we literally live with that, even as an organization, when it uh, goes completely against the world that teaches you, you have to have the best idea, you have to create the greatest structure, you have to get the best employees, you have to do this, you have to all, and where does all that come from? What's the root of all of that? I run the world. I run my life. I'm in control of the events that take place in my life. And you see, Lama said a lot of smart people with a lot of good ideas are having a very hard time making it. So anyway, I just wanna say, I'm very proud of everybody here and we're just starting and we're already doing amazing, amazing things. And for, I'll just tell you for me, I had a huge refuah last night. I had healing. Rabbi Nachman says that when you sweat, I wasn't even Badafka, I only thought about it afterwards. When you sweat from Kadusha, when you mamish sweat, you're soaking from sweat, but in something that's holy, it's a tikkun that you never could imagine for the bread. So uh, anyway, Hashem. So I want to I wanna say something based on this past week's Parsha. I want to mix it in with one of the most amazing Torahs which obviously you guys know I say this about every single one, but I really believe that. And we learn about the first shidduch in this past week's parsha. I know a lot of people here are looking for their shidduch. And I know a lot of people who think they already found it, and they're also actually looking for their shidduch. Because what we're going to learn from Rabbi Nachman ben Fega is that a shidduch is not just a one time I find my wife, I find my husband, but any time that there's peace between spouses, that's called a shiduch. And even if you're married and you don't have peace in your home, that means that Hashem is not giving you your shiduch, even though you're living in the same house. 
And that's actually the reason why you see that father and mother who are fighting and so your parents married and you almost have to like vomit out that they are, even though on paper, there's nothing really married about them. The reason is because you're right. They're married, but there's no shiduch. Because what we're gonna learn is to have a shiduch, to have unity and harmony between a man and a woman is actually supernatural. And for something supernatural to take place, that means it's not granted to you. It's not something that you just accomplish. It's a matana from Hashem that is above nature. So this applies to everybody, whether you're married, you're not married, whether you're looking, you're not looking, whether you're a kid, whether you're an adult, it doesn't make a difference. Everybody's looking for a shiduch. And that's what we're learning, okay? And where's the first concept of a shiduch? And we know that there is a klal, gadol in the Torah amongst the chazal, amongst the Kabbalistic masters, the Hasidic masters, that the first time anything appears in the Torah is the archetype for that situation always. Meaning that the first time a shiduch comes up in the Torah, it must be that a shidduch for anybody for the rest of history is a replay of that event. Does everybody understand that point? Yes, again. The first time anything takes place in the Torah, the Torah is not a history book. The Zohar goes to length to rebuke the person that he thinks that the Torah is just stories. And you don't realize that there's dynamics. You know what a dynamic is? When you are hanging out with your friend and you guys are kicking it and you guys are having a good time together, you're feeling the same things, you're listening to the same music, you're talking about the same thing, you're feeling each other's vibe. So that means that there's a good dynamic there. We're vibing off each other. Same thing goes by a man and a girl. Same thing goes by an employee and his boss. Same thing goes by a Rebbe and his student. Same thing goes by your neshama and your goof, your soul and your body. All of these things are called shiduchim, opposites that need to connect. I know this is deep. Everything in Likut Imran is deep, but I'm trying to make it simple as possible. And with that being said, now that we know that there's a klal gadol, there is a rule in the Torah that if you want to see how anything works, look at the first time it comes up in the Torah. Where is the first time you see a shiduch in the Torah? Seemingly. Yitzchak and Rivka. Because they're the first Jewish shidduch. And the whole concept of the Jewish people is hashkacha prati. That even though we're in a world that's completely based on nature, science, natural laws, the Jewish people have no mazal. And therefore, even though we might look like them, we might dress like them, we might act like them, in fact, everything about your life is malam in teva. It's not based on nature. It's Hashem actually handpicking and deciding for you. So what happens when you try and live your life according to their way, you end up very confused and suffering. Why? Because that's not actually how it works for you. So where's the first concept of a Jewish man and a Jewish woman meeting each other? Yitzchak and Rivka. Okay. So I want to point out a few things. First thing, Eliezer, so to speak, was the mediator, right? Eliezer went to Eretz Canaan to find Rivka in Abraham's home. He wanted somebody who came from his own home, just like the Bukharians know. It's good to meet a Bukharian girl. It's good to be with the Bukharian guy, right? But that concept's actually very old because Avram Avinu said, promise me, because there's something about being Jewish and this needs to be passed on. And I can't explain to you what that is, but you're gonna see it. And when you see it, you're gonna know, because you're gonna, you see me, you see what I'm like. And that's what I need my son to marry into. And if for some reason you can't find it, you don't have to look anymore, but you for sure cannot have him marry a Canaanite. Okay. Some things that we need to understand. What is the concept of Eretz Yisrael versus the concept of Eretz Canaan? We see in the Torah, you have two lands that are mainly spoken about. The land of Canaan, before the Jewish people came and conquered it. And afterward, it was called Eretz Yisrael. The concept of Canaan, 
is the concept of Teva. It's the concept of nature. There's seven nations there and they're connected the seven Midot, the seven Sfirot, the seven Klipot. What are those seven Klipot? The Noam Eli Melech says that they are um, when you give without boundaries, meaning you're giving too much and you're not uh, actually giving to those people who need it or to yourself that needs it. When you're too selfish, that's another nation. You have a nation that's not rooted in truth, it's rooted in your own truth. You have a nation that's rooted in um, brazenness, that's not rooted in holy chutzpah. It's chutzpah that's just because you have an ego. You have a concept of, um, instead of gratitude, you have lack of gratitude. That's another nation in the land of Canaan. Then you have uh, Pagama Brit. That's another nation in, in, the, in, the, in the land. And then finally you have, and I'll explain in a second if you guys don't understand, okay? And then you finally have that I control my life, which is the final land. And the only way for the Jewish people to get to the land of Israel is they have to conquer those seven nations. They don't happen to be there that is the land of Israel when you conquer those nations. And I want to tell you something very deep. Because I'll teach that at the end of time, the land of Israel is going to spread to the whole world. The whole world ultimately is going to become the land of Israel. What's the reason for that? Because there is a concept of uplifting everything in this world. And how do you uplift what's in the world? You have to dominate and conquer the land of Canaan wherever you are. You need to overcome those seven fallen attributes within yourself, not questions yet. You need to conquer those seven uh, nations at large, but this is the whole entire essence that Hashem first gives the land of Israel to the Canaanites, but it's not called the land of Israel there. It's only called the land of Canaan because they're the ones who are, so to speak, they're in control for now, even though it's not actually their land. And then ultimately it's up to the Jewish people to go to the land and to go conquer the land, okay? Avram said, don't bring me a girl from the land of Canaan. She can't be a Canaanite. Why? Because it represents all the fallen lower Midot, meaning ego. You cannot find a girl from my son Yitzchak whose mechut, whose essence is rooted in ego. Because the whole entire Chiddush of Klal Yisrael is gonna be anava, humility. There was no such thing because there was no way that the person could be humble before Avram Avinu, because in order to be humble, you have to believe in Hashem. Because as long as you don't believe in Hashem, even your acts of kindness are for yourself. Because if I give to another person and I don't believe in Hashem, and you say, oh, this guy's selfless. But why am I actually doing that for this person? Why am I doing this kindness? The truth is I'm doing the kindness because it makes me feel good. And then, in fact, in a very subtle way, even that chesed, even though it's a beautiful thing, even the world would put you in Time Magazine for that chesed, still in the end, the root of it is because it makes me feel good that I helped you. The only way a person can actually be selfless is if he has a higher self that's called Hashem. So you cannot have my son marry anybody beside a daughter from a place like that, okay? What did Yitzchak do prior to him meeting his wife? Where was he when he met his wife? He was praying in Mincha in a field. He was in a field. Rabbi Nachman says that Zivug is Malam in Ateva. Rav Natan, his main student, he used to write letters to all of uh, Rabbi Nachman's uh, Hasidim after he passed away, because when you lose your leader, it's very, very difficult for you. But when does it become most difficult? When you have your greatest trials and tribulations. And even though you heard what he said when you were there, you need someone to keep telling you, to keep reminding you, because these are not messages you can hear one time. You have to keep working to internalize them. Comes Rabbi Nachman to tell them, I'm just gonna tell you what Rabbi Nachman said. He said to us over and over again, out of all of the things that take place in this world, the one which makes the least amount of sense 
the one in which is completely not understandable, no matter how smart you are, no matter how much you know about the physical world, no matter how much you even know about Torah, spirituality. There is no way to chapa zivu. Because the amount of systems, the amount of dynamics, the amount of things that are taking place that bring one person from one end of the world to the other, from one end of the city to the other, from one end of the neighborhood to the other, from one scenario to the other is unfathomable. And this is not even just Rebbe Nachman's chiddush, it's mashma, it's implied even in Midrashim, where you see where it says that Hashem, when Hashem created the world and he created everything in the world in the six days of creation on the seventh day he rested, so the rabbis were not like us. Well, how does that fit in with evolution? And how does that fit in with this? And they're like, okay, it's true. And if that's true, so we have a problem. We're saying God runs the world. Seems like he already created everything. So what is he doing now? So the Midrash says, you're right. There's one thing he does now. That's it. He makes Sharchanim. She, oh, sorry, Shiduchim. Thank you. He's making Shiduchim. That's it. That's all he does. He makes Shiduchim. Why do you need Hashem to make Shiduchim? Why couldn't he just give that over to us? It's mala, 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 minateva. Mala, 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 minateva. It's way above everything in the physical world, how all of these things come together. If you're already married, you don't know how much went into that. From even before creation went into that. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years, Gilgulim, 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 Tikunim. Just, uh, there's no way to fathom. Yeah, no way to fathom, no way to fathom, okay? So you see, if you need something that's completely above nature, what do you need in order to be able to connect to something that's above nature? Emuna. Emuna. And Rabbi Nachman says, what is Emuna? Tefillah. And where is, Rabbi Nachman say, the best place for you to do that act of Emuna? In the field. And you see, when did Yitzchak, who represents the first Jewish man meeting the first Jewish woman in the act of a zivug, of a shidduch, he was in the field praying for. How did you get that? <laughs> I would love to know. Unbelievable. I would love to know how you got that. That's you saw amazing. You saw about the medical field. Ah, <laughs> in the field. Beautiful. Did you think yet? You think Yitzchak was in um, was in Yitzchak of pharmacy over there? That was the field that he was in. Ah, it's mamish in your name. That's so so he was in the field, okay? That's one thing you should know. And therefore, the Torah is actually teaching you something very deep. The Torah is teaching you something very deep. And that is that Shiduchim is Malam in Teva. And Yitzchak's ability to be able to get his Zivug first came with tremendous Mesir Nefesh, meaning nullification of his ego, to Avram Avinu, who the Or Chaim HaKadosh explains that he is the concept of the Tzadik Yisrael Olam. So you see Yitzchak Avinu completely humbled himself to the Tzadik without any understanding. People think Yitzchak was a baby when he had the whole thing. He was 37 years old. He was 37 years old. He had a mind of his own. He had his own experiences. He didn't even see the world the way that Avram did at all. His, his whole entire inner world and the way he experienced life and Hashem was completely opposite to his father. And yet when the time came and Avram had said, hey, I have a trip for you. We're doing this. He said, okay. And that's called bittel to the tzaddik. So you see he had complete self-nullification to the tzaddik Yisrael Olam, Avram Avinu, followed by going to pray in a field, which is another act of bittel. And I'm going into the field, self-nullification. I'm going into the field to go pray to Hashem. What do you mean? Why aren't you going on dates? Why don't you ask Avram to set you up? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why are you in a field? It doesn't make any sense. Ma pitom. <laughs> of course. But how did the shidduch come to him? And? And? To the? To? To Avram. Avram, his father, Avram, the Tzadik, the Surah. <clears throat> you tell me, did, you, did your dad ever ask you to go on a field trip with you? He's going to shecht you. And you said, I can't wait, dad. Kaif, let's go. 
<laughs> Can't wait. Shashlik. <laughs> okay. I don't remember. Uh, okay, good. What we're going to say here in this Torah is the Chiddush. That through Bitul to a true Tzaddik, you find your Zivug. And I want to show you that it's not Rabbi Nachman didn't make it up, just like he didn't make up anything. It's just that he had eyes to see like nobody could see. And I wanted to bring it out in the Torah portion to show you it's the first Shidduch. And I want to show you now where it is in the Kutum Aram. Very, very deep, very simple what we're about to say. So everybody, please listen. Hada'at mishadech kol ashiduchim. Da'at is the maker of all matches. Off your phones. Are oh, you making notes? You don't. Okay, good. Da'at is the maker of all matches. You hear? You're looking for a shadchan. You're looking for a shadchan. Now you're looking for a shadchan. What's her name? Das. God consciousness. What? I didn't see her in the local Bukhari news uh, link. Where is this Shadchan? Her name is Dat. Dat. So for us, before we can move forward, we have to understand what is Dat. What is knowledge according to the Torah? Dat is called the unification of opposites. Whatever unifies opposites is called Dat. For instance, right now, you have a sweet, sensitive, marshmallow Ashkenazi Jew, surrounded by tough, rogue, <laughs> chiseled, hairy Bukharian Sephardi Jews. <laughs> okay, everybody who Googles waxing doesn't have hair anymore. Okay, anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, don't worry, it's okay. I'm talking about it. So how do we do this? How am I meeting with you? This meeting doesn't make sense. We don't have similar interests, we don't have similar thought processes, we don't have similar humors. So how are we able to connect? That. The tzaddik. Through the tzaddik, me and you could be best friends. Because at the place of dot, at the place of God consciousness. This is the root of both of us. Da'at gave birth to both of us. So even though we came out different from that place called Da'at, still that's our source. And when you can get back to your source, even when you're just with your opposite, then you actually go back into unity. What is the source of man? We'll call man chesed. It comes from Da'at. Da'at gave birth to chesed. I know it's Kabbalistic, but just suffice it to say, that da'at gives birth to two things. Man and woman, we're going to call them chesed and gevur. Love and awe. Love in the Torah is called man. Awe is called woman. Okay? Now, these two are complete opposites, but they both come from one place called da'at. So if you can ever get da'at, then you can bring together those opposites. Kiko ashiduchim. Because every shidduch that ever was, that ever is, that will ever be, heim shnei hafachim. A shidduch is by nature a unifying of two hafachim, two opposites. Two opposites. If you're looking for a wife, if you're looking for a husband, you're asking for someone, for a person, for a shadchan, for your friend, for your parents, for your shem, to give you your opposite. That's what you're asking for. And Da'at is the mediator between those opposites. Da'at is that Sharchan who is bringing together those opposites. Da'at means God consciousness. But even though it's a thing that's called knowledge or God consciousness, this thing is a living reality. The way that we think of knowledge is information. In the Torah, knowledge is not information. Knowledge is a living, breathing reality. There is a living thing called da'at. And that living thing called da'at is constantly uniting opposites. And anybody who can find da'at can be a part of that process. 
And anyone who doesn't have da'at is not able to be part of that process. Where do we see this explicitly? Because the Torah says that at the end of time, when Mashiach comes, there's going to be peace in the world. What's going to bring peace? Is he going to be a lefty liberal who's coming to bring world peace? Doesn't seem like that works. Is he going to be a righty, conservative? Doesn't seem like that actually brings peace either. So what is it that brings peace between opposites? Man and woman. Dot. And that says the prophet Yeshaya, that Deya is going to cover the world like water covers the sea. That God consciousness is going to cover the world like water covers the sea. And it proceeds to explain how a wolf is going to be with a lamb, how this is going to be with a that. What are all those examples? Opposites coming together. And what's going to be the cause of that? Is it going to be some supernatural heebie-jeebie? Uh, he's fondute. Some holy katorit. Or, or, is there something that's gonna spread over the world which actually unites opposites? It's just the natural function. It's like, it's like, so to speak, there's an energy that's gonna spread over the world. It's called God, God consciousness. It's gonna spread all over the world. And the whole entire function of Da'at is to unite opposites. So as soon as it gets to one location, the Da'at gets there, you're gonna see that all the people who couldn't get along are gonna start growing out. How is that possible? Because when two opposites are in the face of Da'at, they can do nothing besides get along. Because on paper, they can't because they're opposites. But when you get the source of those opposites in the room with them, they're able to come together. By the way, you should know that this is the whole entire Chiddush of Aaron and Cohen. Why was it that he was able to bring peace between man and wife and between friends? Because it's taught in Chasidut that Aaron and Cohen had a different type of da'at than Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu's da'at was to bring man and Hashem together because they're opposites. To take a Jewish boy and a Jewish girl and connect him to something that's completely infinite and not physical, those are two opposites. You need da'at to bring that together. Whose whole entire essence was bound up with that? Moshe Rabbeinu. But Moshe's thing was not to do that between people. He didn't know how to do that. But Aaron did. Aaron didn't know how to connect a person to Hashem. But Aaron knew how to connect people to people. Because he had a different type of da'at. And they said that there's one final type of da'at that Moshe didn't have and Aaron didn't have. And it's a very unlikely candidate for the last one. His name is Yeshua ben Nun. That he had a different da'at than anybody else had. And that was not he was able to link you with Hashem, those two opposites. He wasn't able to link husband and wife or even friends. But he had the type of da'at that no matter who you were, you were going to feel him. Yeah. Sure? Yeah. Opposites in what way? Are we only talking about like personality or? No, we mean in our essence, in our essence, in our essence. Our essence is that they're opposites. It's forget, even add personality and then you make more opposite. But in, in our essence, man and woman are opposites. And the same exact paradigm between a husband and wife, boyfriend and girlfriend is actually the same paradigm as teacher and student. Now the student may not know that, because he grew up in secular culture and he thinks he knows as much as his teacher, but then it really doesn't make sense that he's learning by him. He should learn by somebody else that knows more than him. Otherwise, why are you learning from someone who knows the same amount as you? That's why the Rambam says in Halakha that if you can't find a teacher who knows everything, just find someone who just knows more than you. Right? So in that sense, you're opposite. Why? Because he knows and you don't. So how are you able to connect to your rabbi? He needs da'at. Yeshua ben Nun had a special da'at, and that's what Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu when he said, you're not going to bring the Jewish people into the land. Yeshua is. And what was the reason Hashem told Moshe, or what did Moshe request? 
that his, whoever was going to be the Mashiach and was going to take the Jewish people to the land of Israel, he needed to have Ruach. And Rashi explains what was the Ruach that he needed to have, that he knew what everybody needed. That was his, that was his consciousness. He had this supernatural ability that even though on paper there was nothing necessarily special about Yoshua, but he was tapped into Moshe like nobody else, meaning he knew exactly what Moshe wanted. And at the same time, he had something Moshe didn't have, was that everybody who came into contact with him felt like they knew him their whole life. And for this reason, it was Yoshua ben Nun who brings the Jewish people into the land of Israel. And this is connected, by the way, the Mashiach in the end. And that's why Rav Shlomo Kalabach says, that even though Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest teacher and David HaMelech was the greatest king, was the best king, Moshiach will be the best friend. Because Yahushua ben Nun ultimately is the one who takes the Jewish people into the land of Israel. Okay? Thank you so much. <clears throat> So, does everybody know? I want to hear from the back. What is Dot? What's the special ability of Dot? Someone who has Dot, not you, someone in the back. Did anybody get it? The... Good, beautiful. The bringing together of opposites. That's it. That's what we've said so far. And now we can understand why do you need Dot? What does Dot have to do with me getting my Zivug? The answer is your Zivug is your opposite. To bring together any opposite, for any opposite to ever come together in history, there had to be da. Period. Stam. Al ken kol shiduchim shabolam. Therefore, all the shiduchim that's in the world, kulam nasim al yadei habar da sheyesh baolam. They all come about through the individual da'at in the world. Do you know what he's saying? Do you know what he's saying? When there is a shiduch between a Jewish girl in Eretz Israel and a nice Bukharian Jew from New York. Who is the cause of that shidduch? There's a tzaddik in the world who's called a bardat, a master of dat. He possesses dat. That tzaddik who possesses dat, he's the one who's actually causing the zivu between those two opposites. Do we understand that? No. No. He had that for them. Yeah. And it caused them to get. And it caused them to come together. There's a ripple effect. Yes, we're all connected, and there's a ripple effect. That as soon as a person becomes a bar da'at, he becomes imbued, embedded. Uh, he's swelling with God consciousness, with da'at. Automatically, he starts causing shiduchim in the world. Who to who? to those who are connected to him. Oh, we're going to see in a second. But all can live for me. And therefore, there are times. This is the reason why sometimes it's hard to find your zivug. Why should it be that me, I'm not the worst looking person. I'm not the, the, the least capable person. I'm not like the worst catch. So why is it so hard for me to find my zivug? Because sometimes these two sides of the match are very far apart naturally. That they are opposites. They're a pair of extreme opposites. Meaning that your zivug is not just a normal opposite. They're an extreme opposite to you. And therefore it's even harder for you to find your zivug. Why? Because your zivug is predestined from before you come into the world. And that zivug is going to be opposite to you. So that's at the very least. But maybe they're very opposite to you. In their essence, in their location, they might be across the world. You have no idea. Or they could be next door, or they could be next door from you. They could be anywhere. You could be looking at her. David, Baba David. It's not good for a religious audience. Yes, no questions yet. I know you're getting excited and rolling your eyes in the back of your head. Just one second, Yonatan. I yeah. like your, uh, I like your, um, he love hoot. You're fire though. You look good. No problem, no problem. I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, also mute yourself just very quickly. 
you're going to see that's the whole listen to what he says. He's building this is every lesson in the Kutmaran. He builds up the most beautiful edifice. You know what an edifice is? A structure, a building. Every, this is what I try to tell people. Nobody's ever seen in the Jewish world, in the whole world, a lesson in the Moran like a lesson in the Moran. It's mamish like a tapestry. You ever see a rug? One of those beautiful rugs that the Bukharians have on the side of their houses, like in the, in the like it has no shaykh at all to that room, but you just <laughs> see like a rug with like a lion and like fur and hair. And it's, but it's the most beautiful rug. It was millions of dollars. The kids don't have any money because they spent it all on that rug, but it's a beautiful rug. And it has all these different colors and all these different strings in and out and this and this and that. Persian, Persian, Persian rugs. rugs. Oh, Persian rugs. Persian. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Shashlik. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. But they're so beautiful. And if you take one thing out, you miss the whole thing. The whole thing unwinds. Every lesson in the Kutamaran is a tapestry. And you have to watch as the thing builds and it's beautiful and he brings it and he can't understand till the end. And then you go back to the beginning. It's nothing like it. Okay. And that's why it's so difficult to find your Zivug because he's not just your opposite. He's not just your opposite. He's even more opposite. And that's why it's easier for some people. It's harder for other people. But tikkun lezeh, what's the tikkun? Yeah, what's the rectification? How do I go find my zivu? Okay, great. You just showed me why it's hard. Thank God you normalized it for me. That's very therapeutic. Now I know it's not because there's something wrong with me. They're just more opposite than I anticipated. Two, you just showed me that what's going to bring it together is da'at. And who is that? The one who's holding on to it. And obviously, if you're holding on to it, you make it easier for yourself. But let's say you don't. So how do I get in that time? Still got to get married. Okay. So we need a tikkun. You need to go to the bar dot. You need to go to the one who has da'a to hear Torah from his mouth. Oh, you didn't see that one coming, right? You need to go to the tzaddik emet. You need to go to the tzaddik ador. You need to go to the one who's holding on to da'at. And you need to physically hear the Torah coming out of his mouth. And this enables you to find your zivuk. So have you come to this class and help somebody who's single find the shiva? Whoever's holding on to dot, when you hear Torah coming out of his mouth, you are giving yourself the ability to go find your shidduch. Ki kol zaman shadat bekoach. Because so long as dot is in potential, because Da'at is always there. Everybody come back in. Don't go back on J-Day. J-Wave. J-Wave. J-Date. Sorry. <laughs> J-Swipe. Whatever. Smith Smite. <laughs> no, go to J-Wave. J-Wave is good. I didn't mean to say that. J-Date. Okay? J-Swipe. Sorry. Your Shidduch is with the bar Da'at. But what do you mean? What are you telling me? It doesn't make any sense. Why? But all of a sudden, the dots there, it wasn't there before. All of a sudden, I connect and I hear those teachings, and now I get my shidduch. What happened before that? Where was the dot? The answer is that dot always exists, but sometimes it only exists in potential. But for dot, this God consciousness to be actualized, you need to go hear it from the mouth of the bar dot, the one who's holding on to it. Then there are times it's impossible. It is sometimes impossible as long as Da'at is only a potential, but you haven't actualized Da'at for you to go find your Zivuk. Because they are opposite very much from each other. Because there are times that they are extremely opposite. And then, it's impossible. It's impossible to know how to bring them together and connect them, all the time that this thing called da'at, consciousness, is in exile. It's not in reality, it's only in potential. Al-kan, therefore, tarikh lishmoa Torah mipiv. Therefore, you need to hear Torah from that bar da'at's mouth. 
the master of that, you need to specifically mamish hear it from his mouth. Sha'az yotzei that, and then goes out that from potential into actual. Why? Because the pasuk in Mishle says, "Mi piv da'at utavuna." From the mouth is da'at and understanding. So Rabbi Nachman is teaching you that Solomon Melech is not just teaching you some poetic business. He's teaching you how do you actualize da'at? Mi piv from the mouth. The ability for da'at to go from potential to actual is to speak it out. And now we can understand why Rabbi Nuzal says you have to speak to Hashem for an hour a day. Because your ability to get parnasa is to make da'at go from potential to actual. Your ability to find your zivug is to be able to make something go from potential to actual. Your ability to acquire anything you don't naturally have, it means it's your opposite. So how do you get your opposite? You need a, a nace. You need the bar da'at. And within you, you have a bar dot. Dot is just taking potential and making it a reality. Dot is uniting opposites. And your ability to, so to speak, turn that superpower on is by speaking it out. Because speaking out dot is what actualizes it. Well, that's like the shidduch? That's the mechanism of shidduch, is the speech. You speaking out what you know is what causes the shidduch. So now you're going to understand why do you see so many people whose lives change? They're in debt, hundreds of thousands of dollars. This person has health issues that you can't even imagine. This person can't find their zivug. They're 30, 40, 50 years old. This person has their zivug, but they have no shalom bayant and it doesn't make any sense because the girl's a good girl and the guy's a good guy. You, everybody has some type of problem that's just completely above their ability to help. They can't help themselves. They don't know what to do. What does Rabbi Nachman say? Go talk to Hashem. How is that going to help me? The answer is Da'at. The only thing that can bring those opposites together that you're struggling with, whether it's the lack of harmony in your body, which causes health issues, whether it's a lack of harmony between partners, which causes Shalom Bayat issues, whether it's the lack of unity between you and your future Shidduch, whether it's Parnasa and you, it's only through dot, and the only way to take dot and to actualize it, because dot is what unites those opposites, is when you speak it out. And what is the single most concentrated way that you are able to get the highest hop of dot from potential to actual? To hear the Torah from the mouth of the bar dot. Can that be from reading like his sefer, or it has to be from him being alive and hearing it? So lahat chila, if he's alive and you hear it from his mouth, bidiyavad, you do it from the book, or lahat chila, you learn it from a bar da'at who's teaching you his book, or lahat chila, you learn it from a person who has da'at who's teaching you the tzaddik story. How do you know if someone has da'at? How do you know? You have to pray to Hashem to find you somebody like that. And that you should connect to him and that you should uh, hear Torah from his mouth and that you should have the rut zone to go look after and to run after it and to make sure that it's the right one. How Rabbi much... David. Wait, we're not doing questions yet. <laughs> I know you guys are all excited. I hit a hot topic. Thank God. Just one second. Thank God. I, I like that you guys are energized and excited. That's good. Oh, that's a great question. The que but this is actually, and it's, not live. and it's not live. So then we have to look in the post scheme because there's a difference of opinion on this. According to Ravavari Yosef, you can say, uh, you could say Amin to, K to Kaddish. If it's live, if it's live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The issue is, it could be that from a computer, you're not actually hearing his voice, you're hearing the computer modulating his voice in the sound of the person's voice. So what is the way 100% to guarantee you makayim this Torah is to mamish go hear the Torah from his mouth in person? There's a million, you don't know how much Torah is that he says that you have to go hear it from his mouth. 
This is only one tour where he talks about it. And he's bringing a different element of why it's important that you go hear it physically from his mouth and you see it coming out of his mouth. You hear it from his mouth. But then there's an aspect of seeing the tzaddik's face. There's an aspect of being in the area of the tzaddik. There's many, many different benefits. And this is why the Hasidim are running after their Rebbe. It's not because they're in a cult. It's because all of the benefits come because there's a spiritual energy which permeates from the person who's holding on to this super conscious Superfly energy, you know. <laughs> and then when you hear it from the mouth of the person who has that, then it goes from potential to actual. And then you're able to unite opposites. Even if they are very, very far from each other. So now, where is this hinted to? This is a short tour, so we're going to finish it now, okay? And we're going to go a few minutes over to finish it, but it's worth it. It's Kedai for everybody who's here. But ze otiot shiduch. Rabbi Nachman, the tzaddik Yesod Olam, says it's in the actual letters of the word shiduch. It's in the pasuk, in Malachi, in the Roshe Tevot. Ki siftei chohen yishmeru da'at v'torah. Because the lips of the Kohen... He's safeguarding Da'at and Torah. What are the first five letters of Sifte Chowen Yishmeru Da'at V'Torah? Shidduch. That the lips, the lips of the Kohen, the concept of the Kohen in Chasidut and Kabbalah is the Tzadik. The Kohen Gadol is the concept of the Tzadik Emet. The Kohanim are the concept of the Tzadikim of the generation. The Levi'im are, so to speak, the main students who proliferate those teachings, and then Yisrael are the ones who learn. It's uh, all paradigms. That's why there's one Kohen Gadol, because there's one Tzadik Emet in every generation. There's one Tzadik Ador. So he's the Kohen Gadol. So the Pasuk says the lips of the Kohen, they're the safeguard, like a treasure chest. They're the one who holds on to Da'at and Torah. And that Pasuk, which literally says what Rabbi Nachman taught us so far in the lesson, the first Letters of each of those words spell shiduch. Again, sifte, you have a shin. Kohen, you have a chaf. Yishmeru, you have a yud. Da'at, you have a dalit. The Torah, shiduch. It spells shiduch. You guys can look it up after. The Torah, the Torah. The, the word, the last word is the Torah. The last word is the Torah. Okay? It spells shiduch. V'zehu, and this is the meaning of yevakshu mipihu, that they should seek from his mouth, because the rest of the pasuk then goes that they should seek it from his mouth. The pasuk mamish says this, that yeah, you should seek it where? From the lips of the mouth of the Kohen. It sounds like the Torah is trying to tell you, beautiful, he's speaking out Torah. He's told, no, mamish his lips. You should seek out from his lips, not just that you should seek his Torah, but you should seek to be in a room with him that you hear it coming out of his lips. Because he needs to seek the Torah from his mouth, mamish, specifically from his mouth, not just his Torah. In order that he should bring out da'as from potential to action. And therefore needs to hear Torah Dafka from his mouth. Says, therefore, even if you're by him and he's not even teaching Torah to you, he's just talking to you. Just having a conversation with you. Hey, how's it going? What'd you do today? What's going on? I'm with my family. I'm doing this. You check out the thing today. Yeah. What are you doing? X, Y, and Z. Rabbeinu says that even that person, that bar da'at, there's da'at even in his mundane speech. So every single time you hear words coming out of his mouth, you're giving yourself a better chance for a zivuk. Even though the highest amount of Torah, I mean da'at, comes from the Torah that's coming out of his mouth. Okay? So therefore, everything that comes out of the Kohen's mouth, meaning the Tzaddik's mouth, the Bar Da'at's mouth, has Da'at in it. 
And that's what brings together opposites, whether it's Parnasa or Shiduch, whatever it is that you're looking for. Or even you're already married, you don't have peace in your family. All of a sudden he comes to your house and he speaks to you. And it's actually the fact that he's speaking it out that's bringing you two together. It's him speaking it. You see him speaking it. And even if he wasn't even talking to you about marriage advice, he was just talking to you guys and joking around with you. That would still bring you together. It wouldn't be as powerful as the Torah that comes out of his mouth, but everything that comes out of his mouth has died. But Dafka, the Torah, you should go run after. Ki Torah nikret kala. Because the Torah in the language of Chazal is called the kala, a bribe. Like it says in Pasachim, don't say inheritance, Ella Morsa. Say. Uh, I, I give anyone. Don't say inheritance, say the one who's betrothed. 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 I'm betrothed to you. Not betrothed. <laughs> I know that's what it sounds like coming out of my mouth. Betrothed to you. What does it mean to be betrothed to you? It, it sounds like something from ancient times. But what it means simply is that we're engaged. We're not married yet. We have a plan to get married. That means we're betrothed. That means I'm no longer on the market, but I'm not actually married yet. It's a shit that I'm for you and you're for me. That's it. You're betrothed. So the Gemara in Masechet Pasachim says, don't say when the Torah is speaking and it says it's a Morasha, it's an inheritance for you. Don't read Morasha, inheritance. Read that it's your kala. What's the word for that? Meaning you're being matched already? No, it means that she's your wife. Oh, got it. Okay. The Torah itself is your shidduch. Morasha, Morasha. So it reads Morasha. So yeah, you switch to shin and sim because there's a, uh, there is rules. You can't just um, make up your own thing. There are certain rules that when letters make the same sound, even if they're not the same letter, you can interchange them and derive new meanings from it. You can't just pick and choose letters, but if you have a shin and a sin, and they're coming from the same part of the mouth, because there's five different sounds you can make with your mouth, whatever letters have the same sound, you can exchange those letters in a word and get new teachings from the word. So the Gemara Zashi says you can do it with Laman and Nun. Yes, there's, there's different systems for doing these things. I'm just trying to point out it's a real thing. They've been doing these for thousands of years. These rules are brought down. You need to know what they are. You can't just do whatever you want. But then if you know how to do it, you can actually derive tremendous teachings, which the sages did in the Gemara 2,000 years ago. One of them is this Morsha Morsa. Inheritance, Kala. She's destined for you. Okay. It's not a pasuk, but it's altik re morasha ela morasa. Don't read morasha inheritance. Ex read. Ah, because it's a pasuk that the Moshe Rabbeinu says the Torah is your inheritance. It's your morasha. Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. The yesh ba gam ken shnei hafachim, and there are two hafachim, two opposites, meaning you and the Torah, you and your kala. Ki yesh ba shnei minet otiot. Why? Because in it, there's two types of letters. So now he's saying like this. He's going even deeper. He's bringing us deeper down the rabbit hole. Anybody see Alice in Wonderland? Or, the, or if you're like Benny's age, the Matrix. Okay, same thing. Once you think Rabbi Nachman hits you at the deepest level, he brings you to a new place down the rabbit hole. It's taught in Kabbalah, it's taught in Chazal, that every single Jewish neshama is another letter in the Torah. And if we're learning that men and women are opposites, and we're learning that Jews, in fact, are opposites, and that's why we don't all get along, then in fact, all the letters of the Torah, so to speak, are living opposites. They just are all part of one thing called the Torah. Okay? And where is this hinted to? From the fact that it's called betrothed. The entire concept of the Torah is related to shidduch. Meaning, any single time that you learn a teaching from a Torah, a teacher gives you over a chidush from the Torah, he has just united opposites. Why? Because prior to that, you never had that teaching in your mind because it's not possible for you to derive how to bring together opposites because you don't have da'at. But once a person becomes the bar da'at, then he can keep bringing out new teachings from old writings 
Because now that he has that, he can unite new opposites. So everybody understand? I know this is very deep. A little bit? Not really. Think this part over. God basically means connection. Yes, that means connection of opposites. Thank you, Gabriel. But we're saying now this is in the Torah itself. Meaning, why is it that some people, they can make tremendous connections between things in the Torah? Like, you, like it, we've had it for thousands of years. How does a person come by who's a Balchuva and he's making new understandings of things that you never had before? What's his ability to do that? Because he's a Bardat. Because he has this thing called Dat, he can unite new opposites that were never expounded from the Torah before. Now, even though Moshe Rabbeinu had all of these in potential and prior to, they don't come out until thousands of years later when that tzaddik, when that person who becomes the Bardat comes and unites those opposites. Ushe tzaddik omer Torah. And when the tzaddik teaches Torah, when he, but he says specifically, they, they translate it as teach it, but you see omer when he says it. When he says it and you hear him saying it, He's literally a matchmaker in front of you. He's teaching you, but what he's really doing is making matches between this letter and this letter, between this teaching and that teaching, from this Gemara and that Midrash, between that Zohar and this Pshat. He's literally making Shiduchim of the Torah. Here it's unbelievable. This Torah is unbelievable. Yes. And the greater Bardat he is, the greater ability he has to draw from different places. Some people, you know, they can only, so to speak, teach you from one place. They can only sit in that place. They can only enter that space with you. If you ask him about something else, he can't go there. Sometimes you can't go there because it doesn't, it's not shy. But sometimes you can't go there because he, he doesn't have enough da'at, this, this, whatever this thing is, to be able to go to the other expanse of the world, the other level, the other world of Torah, another madrega, another sod, another drush, another remez, and to pick it and see how it connects. But the person who's able to see how more and more things connect, he has more da'at. And the Mashiach himself is going to be the master of da'at that ever was, meaning... He's the one who's able to unite all opposites. And that's why even Moshe brought down the Torah, but he couldn't bring peace to the world. And that's why Rav Yitzhak Ginsburg says that even though Moshe was the greatest teacher, Mashiach will be the greatest psychologist. Why will he be the greatest psychologist? Because the whole essence of the psychologist is he's giving you dot. He's having you think in ways you never thought before. And that's what's able to unify the broken pieces of your life. Because it's not actually your life that's the problem. It's your inability to unite those pieces in your mind. Because what it feels like for you is just to But when the Bardat comes and tells you, actually, this is good, and you just never thought about it like that, and all of a sudden you leave his office, or you leave the tzaddik's room, and you're like, oh, everything's exactly the same, but I feel great about it. How is that possible? And the reason is that. Why is this? Because the words of Torah pour in one place, in this place, and rich in another place, like it says in the Yerushami. It's rich in one place, poor in another place. What do we say on, um, what do we say when the Shabbat comes in, in Eishet Chayel? You guys should know that when we speak about the Eishet Chayel, the, the valiant woman, the strong woman, even though we literally mean our wives, the Jewish women, on a deeper level, it's talking about the Torah itself. She is the valiant woman. Which, and which part? The whole, the whole Eishet Chayel is talking about the Torah. She is called the Kala. The Torah is called the Kala. The whole entire concept of Shabbat is that the Jewish people, our wife, is called the Torah. The concept of Shabbat is the Torah is in exile for 6,000 years, for six days. And on Shabbat, no matter where you're holding, Hashem makes it that there is a zivug between the Jewish people and the Torah. She's the kala that we're welcoming in. That's what brings redemption, the revelation of the Torah in the world. And what does it say there in Eshet Chayel? It says that she brings bread from afar. You guys know what I'm talking about? We say this in Eshet Chayel. She brings bread from afar. So Rabbi Nachman is bringing, bringing this Yoshami to teach you what does it mean she's bringing bread from afar? She's bringing a pasuk from the other end of the Torah to 
the beginning of the Torah. Because her ability to bring peace to you in your life is by uniting opposites. Why? Because you need to attach together words of Torah from one place to another place. Because by attaching these words from one place that are scattered, they are scattered very far from each other. Just like we learned some Shiduchim are very opposite from each other. Just like the... the the Chiddush that, the, that needs to come out for you to be able to move out to your next place in life, your next stage, your next tekufa, you're going to need that one person to come and attach two parts of Torah that you never hopped before. Just like the two zivugim that are complete opposites, but you don't realize how opposite they are. That's why sometimes you have a problem in your life. You can go to your local, uh, you can go to your local Google rabbi, but then there are problems in your life that nobody can help you with. Because the solution is a big opposite to you. So for that, you need a greater tzaddik to be able to put together those two teachings. By the way, if you don't think this is one of the greatest lessons you ever heard in your life, I'm talking about the book, not me, the book. This lesson, you're, you have, you're not sensitive. <laughs> this is one of the most beautiful, shortest lessons. It's going to end right now. But this, that you could think about this probably for the rest of your life. Just read it over and over. Someone right now is getting married. Amen. And through this Naseh Chiddush Shem Chadshim. Through this is created the Chiddush in which they originate. Nimsa, consequently, as a result, like that when the Tzadik is a Bardat, Omer Torah, he says Torah, it comes out of his mouth. He's naturally creating Shiduchim. Therefore, you need to go hear to her from his mouth specifically. And through this, you're going to be able to find your zivu. Any questions? Yeah, so it sounds like uh, some people, it's very hard for them to get married, yeah? Yeah. Because there's certain blocks, there's certain things that they don't understand. But they go up to this bar that they'll it, give them some advice yeah. that it will finally click so that's not that's not the, no, that's, no, no 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 that that's what it sounds like yeah. it, it doesn't mean that the, the tzaddik's going to give you an eta that's going to bring you your zivuk it it means that there is this supernatural phenomenon that's traveling around the world and it's invisible his name is da yeah. and when he lights up and illuminates like a stone then automatically you find your your opposite it's not that he gives you an etza, which is specific. That's also the case. But when we're talking about you finding your wife, it's just a matter of this da'a thing, this, this entity, which brings together opposites to light up. And it's the Torah that comes out of the tzaddik mouth that you hear that causes it to light up for you to find your zivuk. What about someone who's not connected to a tzaddik or doesn't hear a tzaddik, but they got married? Or someone who's secular, who doesn't even learn Torah? Good. So walk into their house and see and, and examine the conditions of the home. And you'll notice that they also don't have their zivug. Because it's not, the zivug is not just to get married. It's that you guys actually love each other and you're happy and you get along and you have fun with each other and there's peace in the home and you're not angry and you're not screaming and you're not arguing. And your and your children are happy to be in that home, and they they don't want to be like anybody else. They just want to be like their parents, and and uh, something that sounds like it's from a fairy tale, but in truth, for a family that's holding on to dot, it's as it's as likely as a family that doesn't have dot it being complete chaos. So even those people, they also need the tzaddik. Anyone else? Is this ever announced to the bar that, to the you have to go, enough, you have to pray to Hashem that you should find him, that you should recognize that it's him, and that you should run after him with everything you have. Is the bar that, I need to have bar that? Of course. Recognize who the tzaddik? What's that? Is it recognize who the tzaddik? To recognize who it is? Yeah, the tzaddik you meant. Yeah, to recognize who the tzaddik is, to recognize who the bar that is. To, to be in a space that he's near you, that you can go to him. You have to pray for all these things. 
Yeah. Rabbi Nachman. I'm saying, but you're not hearing it from his mouth. Right, so Rav Kramer yeah. taught me his Torah. He taught me all of his Torah. But this is one of the special things about Rabbi Nachman, which I know is hard to fathom. And something which I want to tell you, this is what Joey told me after the class. Joey said after the class, he was speaking with us privately. And he said something which I always thought, and me and Benny always speak about, but it's something that it sounds unfathomable. And if you say it to anybody else, they're going to say, you bugging. But Lama say, you see that there's something that's happening in our generation, which is unlike anything that's ever taken place. And that is that the rabbi who's becoming the most famous rabbi of the generation is not alive. Do you understand what I'm saying? That in every generation before this, the most famous rabbi of the generation was a living rabbi. And what's happening now naturally and organically is that in the final generation before Mashiach comes, the most famous rabbi who's helping the most people is not physically here. And it could be that the tzaddik of this generation Rabbi Nachman of Brazil. Is, not, uh, is not physically here. And that's the chiddush of the final generation. And still his popularity is going to continue to soar and grow because he's the tzaddik ador. And Joey said, said it, mom said it, and he's not a breast lover. You know, he's into chassidut, obviously he believes in it. But he says, you see that for the people of this generation, Rabbi Nachman has become the Rav Hador. Those were his words. He's become the rabbi of this generation. And he brought a chiddush because usually breast lovers, people like me and Benny and everybody who's been a part of this, Part of it is amazing because you finally get answers to things that you never had answers to. But at the other side of it, it's lonely because you have nobody to speak to. You don't have a rabbi to go talk to. It's not the same as any other type of relationship and you feel like you're lacking something. But I heard Joey say something unbelievable. He said it the opposite way. He said, you see that he's becoming the Ravador, he's becoming the rabbi of the generation, even though he's not here. And he says, because he's not here. Because people don't have the patience anymore to wait in line, to go, to, go, to, to go travel across the world, to find that person and to wait for him and to be on his beck and call. We, we, we can just go open up his teachings and go look for them. And it's another way of looking at it. That maybe it's the first time in history he's coming to you. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> I was listening to a shir. It was like a, an Amuna shir. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously it doesn't talk about anything about that or, or tzaddik. And he was talking about how um, if you don't have your shidduch right now, it's because Hashem decides that right now is it's not time. The time hasn't come for your shidduch. Yes. And as soon as the time arrives for your shidduch, it's gonna have not, there's absolutely nothing that can stop it. That's true. That's good. But now Rabbi Nachman's adding a nuance. Where did you hear that? You saw that in Rav Arush's book? Yeah. Okay. I heard it, yeah, I'm sure. Well, okay. unless the person is slacking. Okay, okay one second. Sure. Just, don't, don't bring your own stuff in here. One second. <laughs> don't start sliding in front of everybody. Um, let's just go with what Rebbe Nachman says. Let's back up and let's just go with what Rebbe Nachman says. 100%, it's clear from Mazal that you have a shidduch, it's predestined, and when you're ready, it's going to come, and that's it. But Rabbi Nachman is bringing another facet, and that is that you have an ability, so to speak, to give your, to increase your odds, to make that happen sooner, quicker, more efficiently, and more long-lasting. And that is that you can go run after your zivug, not by running after your opposite sex, not by running after even shadchanim but by running after the Torah that's coming out of the mouth of the Bardat, then you, so to speak, you are giving yourself the ability, not so to speak, you're giving yourself the ability to get your Shiduch quicker. Yeah, Unless, and No, so you missed it. He's saying that Da'at, no, no, so you missed it. He's saying that Da'at exists in potential. What brings you your Shiduch is when your Da'at becomes actual. The Da'at, when it becomes actual, unites those opposites in actuality. So why isn't it actual for you yet? Because you don't hold on to da. 
only the barda told them to die. Not you specifically. So listen, when you hear Torah from his mouth, when you hear the Torah coming out of his mouth, before that, da'at for you is in potential. That's why you don't have the shidduch. When you hear it coming out of his mouth, that's what actualizes it. It coming out of his mouth and you hearing it. That's the actualization of it. And then all of a sudden you click the mechanism and now the da'at went from potential to actual. Your shidduch went from potential to actual. That's what the Torah is saying. That's in the Torah. I promise you, if you go back and listen to the class, you'll see it. So that's not exactly what you just heard. For me, you just made that up. Because if you don't hear the Torah from the tzaddik's mouth, then the dot's still in potential for you. But the sooner that you hear it from his mouth, the sooner it becomes actual for you. You're saying no, but he's saying not like that. And you have to go figure out who knows more. I'm being very honest with you. You have to go figure out who knows more. Anybody else? Rabbi David. Uh, but Wait, there's, there's a girl in the back, someone who went to co hear the teaching, so we're going to give her first priority. Live in person, not sitting on the couch eating cheese puffs. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's connected to that. Make yourself a rav. But Rabbi Nachman says it can't just be any rav. It has to be the bardad. So there is a level of a rav that could be unique to you, but there is a rav that's for everybody who he's called the bar da'at, and he's holding on to the, all the da'at in the world. And therefore, Rabbi Nachman, for instance, there's a story of the seven beggars. I don't know if you guys ever read any Rabbi Nachman's stories. It's called Sipoy Masyot. Seven beggars is something that even in the secular world, it's achieved critical fame. There are some of the most famous writers and um, uh, people in that world who their whole entire inspiration was a story called The Seven Beggars. Very interesting. It's worth reading. It sounds like a, a, um, a twisted children's story. And at the end of the story, there's a part where there are these arrows and they have this poison in it. And each of the arrow has a different type of poison. And a person was injected with all 10 of these arrows with 10 different types of poison. And you can go to different doctors and each doctor has one cure for one of those types of poisons from those arrows. But there's only one doctor who's able and actually has the cure for all 10. And this is Kenege the Barda. This is Kenege the Tzadi Kador. That there are tzaddikim in the world that you can find them and they'll have the cure for one problem that you have. But they won't have the cure for all your problems because there's only one person every generation who has the cure for all of them. It's called the tzaddik Ahmed. Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu. In this generation also, there's a Moshe Rabbeinu. Good question. She's doing good. What's your name, by the way? Michelle. Why haven't you been in the classes yet? You just found out. You're good for this class. You should know. You should keep coming back. I know why you're asking. I know what you're asking. You want, you want to know why I know why you're asking? Because everybody asks the same question. Anyone who has intelligence asks that question you just asked. Okay? So you're in good company. You're not the first person to ask the question. It's been asked for years. What's the question? Question is, doesn't this sound like Yeshka? Doesn't this sound like what Christians say that there is this person who, so to speak, is holding on to your salvation? Yeah, so it sounds like the Bardat. Okay, so we didn't say dying for sins. That's implied by a person. He knows things that you don't know, and he's going to teach them to you, and that's going to help you in your life. That's the same thing for you. Ma, I can't hear you. Okay, very simply like this. Very simply like this. The Arizal, and you need to know, whenever the name the Arizal comes up, there's a special koach of the Arizal, the power of the Arizal, that nobody is cholek on the Arizal. What does it mean? There's not one person who argues on anything the Arizal says, ever. Ever. Even if an Ashkenazi person will say, I don't live by those teachings, or I, don't, I have not become a master of those teachings, 
No person's ever going to say he's wrong. Nobody ever said that about the Ariza. Okay, so I just want to tell you this coming from the Ariza, what I'm about to tell you. The Ariza teaches that there is a Neshama that's called Moshe Rabbeinu. And from the beginning of existence until the end of existence, every Jubilee, every Yovel, every 50 years, from the beginning of time until the end of time, this Neshama is reincarnated into this world. The soul of Moshe. The soul of Moshe. And he even tracks it back even before Moshe was born into the world. Where the Arizal says that even before the physical Moshe was born, there was a soul Moshe that was in people even before Moshe. Like Noah. That the Arizal teaches that the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu was in Noah. And even before that, it was, it was in Shaked. And even before that, it was in heaven. And even before that, it was in the garden. It wasn't even in Adam or Chava. It was just in the garden. <laughs> Beautiful. And Moshe's father-in-law was the recreation. One second, oh. Jonathan. Stop slip sliding in here. One second. We're getting okay, in the room already. There's a lot of fire coming out right now. Okay. <laughs> Wait. So the Arizal actually lists out all of the reincarnations of this soul. But ultimately, where is this coming from? All of the Jewish people are actually, all of our souls are part of one tree. If you look at a tree outside, that physical tree is actually a reflection of a spiritual tree called the collective souls of Klal Yisrael. And spiritually, it's like a tree that you have roots, you have a trunk, you have branches, you have twigs, you have leaves, you have fruits, and so on and so forth. You have shrubs. The trunk of the tree is Moshe. Why? Because everything that comes out of the tree is actually an extension of the trunk. That even if you go all the way down to the fruit, which is four times removed from the trunk, still, if you keep going all the way back, you're going to get back to the trunk. And that trunk is the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu in every generation. This is the Arizal. So nobody argues with the Arizal. It's as Jewish as it gets. Meaning to say, and it's all based on Kabbalah and Zohar, that even Sadiqim who come and give you Chidushim from somewhere else in the world, every Chidush that a Torah teacher teaches you, it's actually deriving from that Sadiq of the generation, that soul of Moshe Rabbeinu. That's the reason why Chazal say, whenever you learn anything that's true, it means it comes from Moshe at Har Sinai. Yeah, it's in Chazal. This is, in, this is everywhere. Yeah. If you learn any Torah teaching that's true, Moshe must have got it. What does it mean he got it? I mean, he's still getting it. He's still at Har Sinai teaching us. Yes. Still receiving and you don't know who he is and he's still giving it to other people and they're claiming it for their own. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so that's the answer to your question. Your ability to get the healing to one arrow, you can get it from your local rabbi if you're lucky. But for you to get healing for all 10 arrows, you're going to need the doctor who has the antidote to those 10 things. And that's called the soul of most remain on every generation. Yes, it's connected to Mashiach as well. The final reincarnation of Moshe is going to be Moshe. It's going to be Mashiach. All the ones before this are different extensions and preludes to it, you know, like trailers in a movie. But ultimately, the final reincarnation of Moshe is Mashiach himself. Does he remember who he is, though? Everything he's reincarnated? I don't know. I'll give you his phone number. You'll ask him. Wait, Rabbi, can I ask? But if so you want to say, so the Christians say this JC it connects. The answer is that there's a stickle truth to what they say. However, the way in which they brought it down is completely distorted and therefore led to the death of millions and millions of innocent people. But there is an element which is definitely true, and that is that there is a tzaddik who is fundamental to the rectification of existence. And uh, you obviously have to learn the truth about that concept so that it's good for you and not make up something of your own with that because that could lead to 
a cult and uh, the death of many, many, many innocent people over the course of thousands of years that we're still recovering from. Is there a bar that, um, if, like, let's say a law, you heard from the bar that, yeah. And then you hear from this rabbi, so is it the ever that you hear from the rabbi? It's not as good as hearing from the tzaddik himself, right. but it's still it's better. It's be, it's better than anything else. Right. It's better than reading it from the book. It's better than right. Rabbi Nachman says this explicitly. It's better to hear it from the person who heard it from him, but still, it's much much better to hear it himself. I was also wondering. Yeah. What? what Don't worry. Nobody else has questions. No. <laughs> uh huh. It doesn't stop him. <laughs> nobody gets it. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. No, there's there's like a uh, twenty people over here that have questions. Go ahead. Okay, so with this, <laughs> um, I was wondering what sin did uh, Moshe Rabbeinu do so that there could still be the rule of him? It's not a sin that he. It's not a. Case, it's not a. It could be like when he hit the rock instead of speaking to it. So the bar that of this generation is like in order to rectify that. Rectify that. He has to speak. speak. So is that is there any connection to that? Yes. Okay. Stay tuned for next class. <laughs> Very, by the way, you should you just machav in something very deep. You should go home and, and go have a cold drink and celebrate. We, uh, Rabbi, we have some questions Rabbi, online. Can Rabbi somebody, David, how, how, yes. is, how is Mashiach going to be the reincarnation of Moshe Rabbeinu if during the Gerola we're supposed to see Moshe Rabbeinu standing next to Mashiach? Good question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the answer, the, 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 answer, the question is, there's a tradition that when Mashiach comes, he's going to be standing next to Moshe. So how can he be standing next to Moshe and be Moshe? If Mashiach is Moshe, how is he standing next to Moshe when he arrives? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't there a movie like that? You think, you know, thing one and thing two? Shula, Shula, he said Moshe, <laughs> Okay, you guys ready for the answer? Uh, yes. Okay, the answer comes like this. First of all, you have another question. How can it be Moshe if he has to come from David? We know that he comes from the house of David. That doesn't sound like Moshe. Okay. The answer is something very deep, which, deep, which is brought down in Chassidut and Kabbalah, and that is that when Mashiach arrives, he is going to look, sound, act like Mashiach like David, but inside of him is going to be the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu. Yes. And that's why he's next to him. Because his body's next to his soul. Where does Abraham come in? Abraham is connected to both in you know, It's too deep for, for one for five seconds, but um, suffice it to say that Abraham um, reaches his um, Moshe was in reality what Abraham was in potential. Speak a little bit louder because you didn't get any louder. You just did more of this. Yes, it's going to make you want to go do Hippodidu because you're hearing the words from the Mouth of the Tzaddik. The dot is going to go on, it's going to turn on for you, and you're going to want to go do Hippodidu. Okay. It's not me. I'm not saying anything. I, I'm just trying to teach you how, in every single Torah, you could see that when Rabbi Nachman says that you should do an hour of Hippodidu, then you go, okay, so he said it in the Torah over there explicitly. He hinted to it in other places. He talked about it in other places, but he has other Torahs. He talks about other things. So why did it become like this big, 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 big thing? And the answer is, if you have eyes to see, you could see that every single Torah is another reason why Hippodidu is the key. I feel, and I'm, like, I feel like his question is a deeper thing because you're saying that, now you're saying, but yeah. the Tzadik is saying yes. that he's the one who's holding on to that. So yes. You connect and you learn from him. You you come and see him, then you take this dot and you actualize and it. And you, how do you actualize it? You actualize it by speech. Yes. That means theoretically what he's saying, if you're not actualizing, if you're doing it, then you're kind of like in this limbo. limbo. Yeah, yes, you're in the limbo. Right? Yes. Oh, yeah, you're right. No, no, it's okay. Yaakov. Oh, Yaakov, you're doing good. Yes. Yes, you're in limbo. 
If you don't do ibodidu, but you listen to the teachings, you don't get to actualize what's in potential. Very good. Like peanut butter and jelly. Yes, yeah. peanut butter and jelly. Any other questions? You guys have any questions back there? Yeah, go ahead. And how do you connect to Hashem? So then why are you in a class? So I'm trying to explain to you. It's, it, I know it sounds like a, not part of Judaism, but it, no, no, I'm just saying it's, it's, a, it's there, it, Hashem made the journey to Hashem in a way that he wanted that there should be shepherds, that there should be shepherds that, that you have the merit to connect to. And through that relationship, you're able to know Hashem more and more. Because even though Hashem gave a Torah and we can all go look at it, your ability to derive benefit from that Torah is dependent on your ability to have eyes to see. And nobody has eyes to see like the person who has worked on himself every day of his life or every day of his whatever journey to try and continue to go to higher and higher and higher spiritual and physical levels of mastery. And now the way the eyes that he has for the Torah now make it that it becomes more accessible to you. Like for instance, Rav Natan, who was Rabbi Nachman's main student, before he came to Rabbi Nachman, he knew the whole Gemara, he knew the whole Torah Kula. When he got to Rabbi Nachman, he knew the whole Torah, and yet he was sad, he was angry, he was confused, he felt lost. Yeah, but he knew the whole Torah, so why is he feeling all those things? Because he didn't have, he didn't have the tzaddik. What does it mean? When Rav Natan got to Rabbi Nachman, they said, what made Rav Natan different than all the other Rabbi Nachman students? Rabbi Nachman had students who were much smarter than Rav Natan. He had students who were much more charismatic than Rav Natan. He had students who had much greater ability to do Hidbodidu for longer and more intensely than Rav Natan. But Rav Natan by far, and it's not even close, got more from Rabbi Nachman than any of the rest of them. What was the reason? Because of what Rav Natan said. They used to say to Rav Natan, how are you going to just nullify everything you know to this person? You already have learned so much in your life. He said, you're right. I know a lot, but he knows everything. And what is a lot in the face of everything? Nothing. Nothing. Yes. But I understand, but what I'm asking you is, if you look in the Torah, you see, what, when did the Jewish people start their relationship with Hashem? What was the beginning? When they left Mitzrayim. How did they leave Mitzrayim? How come they didn't just leave? That's right. Hashem made the Jewish people in a way that we have the ability for geula and potential, both on an individual and collective level. But the only way to actualize that potential is to bring a Moshe Rabbeinu into the picture and that we all become one united whole with him at the Rosh, with him at the head. And it's not that Moshe wants to, it's not that Moshe is looking for attention, it's not that Moshe thinks he's better than anybody, it's simply that Hashem infused him with this thing called da'at because of his level of humility that is higher than everyone else, meaning he made himself more nothing than everybody else. And as a result of that, he connected himself to the thing that's everything that's Hashem. And because we're not all holding at that level of complete humility yet, and we're working on it, and Bezret Hashem will have the schut, we still have to connect to the one who does, and his name is Moshe. But... 100% through it, the, the whole reason why you want to connect to the tzaddik is to connect to Hashem. It's not, it doesn't end there. He is, so to speak, the portal for you to be able to do it, but it's not him in and of itself. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was at Har Sinai, Hashem said to Moshe, you should know I'm only giving you the Torah for them. The only reason I'm teaching you everything that I am, and you're going to hop it in a way nobody ever will, is only because I want you to give it to them. But Moshe's whole ability to do that came from the fact that he made himself like nothing. 
And I don't know about you, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to completely nullify your ego that you don't think that you exist anymore and you're still functional. But there is one person every generation who did it. His name is Moshe. He's physical because he's spiritual. There's a spiritual entity called Moshe and it manifests as Moshe Rabbeinu and it manifests as a tzaddik of every generation. Yes, the Rizal body. says he didn't even have a body at one point. He's called the light that Hashem shone into the world and hid away for the tzaddik. Yes. Beautiful. Why don't you? Why do you do that? Why do you need to do that? I thought we're all equal. What was the question? The question is, it sounds like a minyan. You have a minyan and a chazan. So the question is, why do we have a chazan? It should be, we should all be the chazan. And the answer is, that if one person leaves that minyan, the chazan doesn't matter anymore. And at the same time, if you don't have a chazan, you don't have the minyan. Everybody serves a crucial role. Nobody's role is less or more important. It's just different roles. This is the whole entire Bilbo confusion of our generation. Because everybody's taught to be number one, meaning that you reach this place, that we all want to reach that place. But the Torah teaches it's not in Mitzvah, it's not in reality. This guy's going to excel at work. This guy's going to excel at learning. This guy's going to excel at praying. This guy's going to excel at tzedakah. This guy's going to excel at doing acts of loving kindness. This guy's going to excel in hipotidut. And if you try and be great at what this person's going to be great at, you're not going to be able to, and you're going to be sad as a result. And how chaval that is. Why? Because you have this false understanding that your greatness comes in being like someone beside yourself. For you to be great, you just need to be yourself within a collective whole called Klal Yisrael. And everyone has their own part. There's Rosh B'nai Yisrael. There is the hands of B'nai Yisrael. There's the feet of B'nai Yisrael. There's the nose, there's the eyes, there's the mouth. We need all of it. You can't come along and say, can you imagine the mouth says, I want to be the eyes. The eyes are going to say, please don't do that. Because then nobody can know what I see. Because they see, they know what I see through you saying it out loud. And vice versa. This is the whole entire chesron lacking in our generation. Even with men and women. That the way that they're making it sound is that women have to be just like a men. Why? Why would you want to be like a man? <laughs> really, it, it's like, we have so many lackings. Why would you want to be like us? Oh, no, but I'm going to wear a suit like them, and I'm going to act like them, because I want to have that same. But why would you want to? You would only want to if the generation society convinced you that the best thing in the world is to be a man. But if the best thing in the world is to be who you are, then you don't need to be like anybody else. It's perfect. You're great. He's great. You're great. You be you to the fullest. He'll be him to the fullest. You'll do that together. That marriage works. That's it. Beautiful. Nobody's upset. Nobody's angry. Nobody's confused. They say that when Mashiach comes, everybody's going to know exactly who they are, what their role is, and nobody's going to be upset about it. Everybody's going to be thrilled and excited. Like Eliezer. Like Why? Because it's the thing that's making you upset is not the fact that you're not the Rosh. The thing that's making you upset is you don't realize that whatever part you play is just as essential as the head. Because the head without a body is not functional. The body without a head is not functional. The hands without the feet are not functional. Every single part is equally essential. They just serve different functions. Moshe is the Rosh. It's like a symphony. It's just like a symphony. Beautiful. It's just like a symphony. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. She could. A lot of times when a person becomes a Shadchan, it's because they have this natural connection to Da'at. That's why they like being Shadchanim. Like I know a, a, a girl. She's actually, uh, she works for us. She's the treasurer of Tzion, Sarah London. And she really has a passion for being a Shadchan. She's Baal Tshuva. 
and she uh, would be amazing at it, naturally, without even trying, because she has tremendous dot. She's able to see how two pieces, which seemingly on paper do not fit, actually form one beautiful unity. So any shadchan, if they're able to unite opposites, has dot. Even not, it doesn't make a difference. That's the whole point. Anybody who's able to bring together opposites has dot. That's what dot is. And the more that a person's able to see how opposites come together, the more dot that person has. Now, some people got that as a gift, meaning they just are born, so to speak, with this natural connection to dot. And the Torah is going to sharpen that thing for them. But they may have already been born with this ability, so to speak, to see how things come together. It's like a sense, an intimate sense. Anybody else on the computer? We have any last questions? Yeah. Um, you said, hey, hold on, let me pull it up. I just wrote notes. Um, so if the opposite is like the essence. So is it possible to like understand what our essence is and thus understand what like the opposite of our essence is in order to find a zivug? Yes. Or is it not possible for us? Yes, it's possible, but only through the tzaddik. Any other questions? Someone said, how can someone be selfless and not feel good feeling inside and feel Hashem? How can somebody be selfless and not feel good feeling inside and feel Hashem? So the whole reason, a per I, think what, I, I think I understand the question. Pretty much if a person is actually selfless, they can't feel bad. The reason a person feels bad is because they feel bad about themselves. No. So the whole reason is because we're taught that our whole essence is bound up with ourself. Like for instance, um, let's say you help a friend out. You didn't get anything from it. You feel good. Why do you feel good? It was a selfless act. What did you get? You felt like you did something. You did what you were supposed to. You did what you were supposed to, okay. But really, whenever you connect, you have to lose yourself, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. For you to really connect to another entity, another person, another thing, you need to lose ties to your ego, either momentarily or permanently. So for instance, if you're with your spouse, I don't know if any of you are married, but anybody who ever gets married is confronted by this very strong reality that is, me and my wife don't naturally get along, even if we're similar. And maybe you do before you have kids, maybe you do before this, probably not, but let's say you do, okay? Why aren't you getting along? Because you both have a self <clears throat> and those selves are different. And you're putting those two selves in one space and you're supposed to function together. But this self is not like this self. So if I think one way, I act one way, I feel one way, and the other person thinks, acts, and feels another way, how do we ever connect? The answer is only when one of them becomes selfless. And when does it become the best? When they both become selfless. That's the only way. Because if I'm constantly only looking to get my needs met and the other person's always constantly looking to only get their needs met, then we both end up unfulfilled because nobody can know what you need and your own self is a limitless ego. And therefore you'll never have your needs met. But what if you change the way that you are oriented to the world and you stop thinking about what you need from your partner and your partner stops thinking about what they need from you. And instead you're thinking only about what you can give to your partner and your partner is only thinking about what they can give to you. Then everyone gets their needs met and everything is a free gift and it's even better than even if you wanted it. But to do that, you need to be connected to truth because there's no way for people to nullify their ego unless there's a greater truth.
the same struggles as any any girl. They need they can get they can just get married. If those hashkafas are based on the absolute truth. But if those hashkafas are based on a half truth, like for instance, let's say when I was secular, if I would have married another girl who had the same political views as me, who had the same ideas as me, we're going to have a half a kid and a half a dog, you know, we're going to get a home. <laughs> no, and so I'm saying, and now you go higher, whatever it is, you have a, I, but for sure, it, it, it it's, it makes it uh, work out better. But if you both are connected and you both have your, what was the word you used? Your hashkafa from the tzaddik, meaning your hashkafa actually comes from this Moshe, then you can have the greatest level of peace and you can have the greatest level of unity. No, no, it's a recipe for disaster, 100%. It doesn't mean that you have to have the same by the time you start. But for sure, if there ever becomes peace in that home, their hashkafas have to become aligned at some point. As long as you want to grow. What? As long as you both want to grow to that goal. Well, that's obviously how it comes together. Otherwise, it's impossible. Like, I'll just give you a practical example. I'll give you a practical example. Let's say, for instance, uh, I figured out I don't want my children to have technology. I don't want them to always be on a phone all the time because I feel like it's ruining their child's ability to think, to be creative, to be able to be excited by the world itself and not by extra stimuli. And my wife is not so makpid. She's not for it. She's not against it. She just doesn't really care. Now, all of a sudden, what happens is when I'm home, I'm going to try and limit my child's ability to be on those things. But then they're going to say, Ima, can I do it? And Ima's going to say, if you want to. And then even if Ima says, oh, whatever Abba says, but you just told me before I can. So what's going to happen? The kid's going to be confused. And that's just with a child. But this is just even within both of yourselves. The ability for you to have peace comes with you both having a da'at that's higher than both of you that you both connect to. The, the higher that da'at is and the more you both connect to it, the more peace it's going to be in that home. And obviously, the more that you're naturally opposite, like for instance, me and my wife, that I'm Ashkenazi, I grew up secular from America. And my wife is Temani, she's Yemenite, she's Sephardic. She grew up religious in Israel. So this is Rabbeinu's case of the extreme opposites. How do those people ever not just come together, but how do they continue to have a shidduch even after they married, even just between them? And then especially even more when they have children, you mamash have different sides of every type of reality coming together, but now it has to fall out into children or to that family. For that, you need the greatest tzaddik and the greatest da'at and you need to both do your best at your own level to try and connect to that place. Okay. Everybody have an amazing night. I want to give you the schedule for the rest of the week. Tomorrow night, we have a class with Rav Tom Rizino. This is the one on, this is crossing the narrow bridge. This is taking these deep teachings of Lakuta Moran and simplifying them and making them very practical for every daily situation in your life. It's very good day for you to go to those classes. If you're a guy, if you're a girl, you can watch on Zoom, okay? Then on Tuesday, we have our actual Kutumaran class. I usually don't teach the Kutumaran on Sundays. I had an inspiration in my Hibodadut. And usually when Hashem gives me that Ruach, it's a good idea and I go with it. So I wanted to say this piece. It was a small piece. But the actual Kutumaran classes every week are on Tuesday nights. Those we do longer pieces and we really delve in. It takes us weeks or even months to finish a piece. 
that the men, you come, women, you can watch online. Wednesday, we have making money with Amuna. That's Rob Tomer again. He's going to show how you take all of these teachings that are really rooted in Amuna above nature and yet still go to work and be able to work with Amuna. Okay, you're going to have to go and find out what it is. Okay, that's Wednesday night. Thursday is our weekly Kumsitz. Bezrat Hashem, we should have a beautiful Kumsitz on Thursday night. And um, yeah, last thing. It's not co-ed yet. Right now it's still, but after this past one, that was that was pretty good. I think we might be able to make a situation that we could. Right now it's it's just men. Maybe once a month, yeah, okay. Um, so we'll figure it out. But I wanna tell you again, there's a video that just went out that we worked very hard to make. It's a five minute short clip about what the we organization is trying to do and who we're trying to help and how we're trying to do that. Please go into those groups, the Tzion Breslov, whether it's the women's group or the Cloys or whatever group that you're in, the classes group, watch the link, watch the video. If you resonate with what, you're, what we're doing, you believe in what we're doing, or if you're just started and you're starting to feel that there's something real here, something different, something transformative, something that could be a help to you and to those around you, which I'm telling you right now, I promise you on my life, there's nothing better that can help people than the truth. The truth of truths from most Rubenu, okay? And this, and I, if you just started coming to the classes, you should know there's been a lot of, a lot of falling and, and, and destruction before and bitterness that came before this realization. I didn't grow up and like all of a sudden someone gave me the Kool-Aid, you know? There's uh, it was a lot of falling and getting up, a lot of falling and getting up. So please contribute, help us so that we can put out more teachings so that we can bring out more things. There's many things that we want to do. We want to write books. I want to write a book, Bezrat Hashem. Rav Tomer wants to write a book. Sion Press, Benjamin wants to write a book. We're going, to need, we're going to need funding for books, to write books. We, I'll just tell you, we created on, with, with government papers, we actually created a yeshiva for Tzion. But in order to actually bring it into actuality, we need a building in Eretz Israel, in Yerushalayim, Sot Hashem. We're going to need money for that. So we're, we're going to need help where we can teach this to men, we could teach this to women, we could teach this to children, everybody at their own level. So at the Shem, and it won't be based on your background or who your parents were or your lineage. If you have a rut zone and you want to come get close to Hashem, you come to Tzion. We got you, okay? We want to get into mental health. I used to be a social worker and a mental health clinician. I was a therapist, a substance abuse counselor. I want to bring it to that world. I want to get into jail cells. I want to bring it to them. We're going to need a lot of financial help to do all these things. And these plans are real. They're not in the air. We can actually do them. We simply need funding to be able to. I promise you there's no better cause than this. If you can, or if you can't, or you can only do a little and you know someone else who can, show them the video. It's a little tiny video. Even if they're completely secular, they're going to be able to hop what we're doing, okay? The more that we can get financial help, the more that we can help. Everybody have an amazing, amazing week. Have an amazing Rosh Chodesh Kislev. We should all be able to see the light in the darkness this Kislev. It's coming up.